Hi, my name is Spiro Christopoulos and I'm the school captain here at Trinity Grammar School in 2020. Today we bring to you an extraordinary success story for Trinity Grammar School. One that's all about persistence, hard work and fighting against the odds. A story of great self-belief and what you can achieve when you really put your mind to it. Many of us in Australia have heard about the big four banks, but there is one which is on the rise and climbing its ranks in Australia at the moment, and that is called Macquarie Bank. Our guest today is an executive director at this growing multinational investment bank, and he hails from the renowned class of 1984, one of Mr Moore's favourite group of students, and he is no other than Mr Lex Gow. Lex, good afternoon. Spiro, Thanks for joining thank, us. Well, thank you very much for inviting me back. It's great to have you here. This yeah. is our first uh, interview post-COVID. The last one we did was sort of yeah, at the enough, peak, yeah. so yeah. it's great to have you in here with a, a great story today. Just to begin with, for our younger students that don't really know the magnitude of, of Macquarie Bank, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the bank and, and where it's at in your role there? Well, when I started, when I finished um, university, there was, I think, 2,000 people in the bank. There's now 15,000 globally. And I think the previous year we made, uh, I think, in excess of $2 billion net profit. So mm. it's a substantial bank now. You know, it's got offices in, and I, I couldn't even tell you now, maybe 50, 60 different countries around the world. Mm. And basically covers the a myriad of products. You know what I mean? They've got, you know, infrastructure. You know, it goes on to airlines, foreign exchange, interest rates, uh, equities. I think they're one of the biggest energy traders in uh, the USA now, which is rather interesting for Australian bank to mm. actually be, you know, top three in energy trading and oil trading, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, it's got its tentacles in a fair few spots, so to speak. And your role there? What What is your role? So in my role is I run a desk called uh, Forwards and Basis Trading. So it's an interest rate trading desk that we have. And we mm. basically look after all the different uh, interest rate curves and interest rates exposures of the banks and the customers and everything. And it actually goes out, to, we trade out to like 30 years as well. So it's a, wow. it's a rather spicy bit of the curve if you get out that far when you're doing deals and everything. And we get to do many other things on the desk. We can trade commodities, mm -hmm. um, FX. We trade a lot of FX here and there when it suits us. So, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty nice thing. We have another last little part of the business where we actually look after the bank's balance sheet yep. in terms of day to day. So it sounds a very minor job, but it's kind of looking after, you know, 24 different currencies that every day have to be squared up. And if you were to see the volume of the deals and the face, mm. you know, face value of the deals that go through, it's a, it's a conglomerate that is, uh, you know, ever changing. You know, it's, it's the magnitude of the deals is rather large, so to speak. It's fascinating the money mm. that goes through our banks exactly. and, and the money that would go through. And the through, face yeah. values as well that get turned over and mm. you know, taken from one country to another daily. It's amazing trade. All those theories we learn about in economics it and business studies in real come, life. It does. comes it together. Spirit, yeah, 100%. Now let's go back to 1982 to begin uh, with. Yes. Um, you were in year 10. Yep. Uh, it's a little bit of a, a crossroads for many people, mm. but 1982... Uh, for all of our viewers out there, it was the year that Eye of the Tiger was released, and more importantly, it was the year that Parramatta won their second consecutive premiership against uh, Mr Moore's Manly Seagulls. So it's beloved Seagulls. It was a big year, and sorry to do that, yes. just to reflect on your age, well, Lex. I was very happy about that event, but anyway. <laughs> um, and you do look great. You have an age Thank well, you so Thank you. Thank you. that's a positive. But it's a bit of a crossroads, and you weren't really yeah. concerned about academics and school at that point. Yeah, I think you know. I think year ten is a very big thing because you still have the option of finishing school in year ten, and you know maybe looking at doing a trade or something. Um, I think my mindset in year ten was that everything would be all right, and you just keep going along, and you, you finish year twelve, and you go and work out what will happen there. But what happened for me in year ten was basically after having a uh, interview with the careers advisor. Uh, the letter came back or was intercepted by Ian Moore, um, basically that I should leave in year 10, that my attitude was, you know, not appropriate for the school or, you know what I mean, there was no real foreseeable future for me there or, you know, the extra two years wouldn't help me at all. Mm -hmm. I had one other very interesting uh, incident that happened that changed me in year 10 and uh, I had a friend I went to school with at Padstow Heights Primary School and he actually became a motor mechanic. And I bumped into him at the end of year 10. He'd left in, I think it was year 9 or something. And mm. I, I hadn't seen him for, you know, two, three years since primary school. Mm. And um, I was talking to him and he said to me, Lex, whatever you do, do your study. You don't want to become what I've become. And I said, why is that? He says, I'm under the sump plug in the middle of winter. I've ripped all the skin off my nails. I've got oil coming down. I'm picking up coal parts. He goes, it's horrendous. He goes, just try your best. You do not want to be where I, where I am. So mm. that was another thing that kind of, you know, 
kind of added that to the careers advisor kind of chat and kind of put me on the road to say, well, you know, you're at the crossroads. You've you've got a choice. You either knuckle down and give it a go or yeah. you kind of know your downside and your downside is not being disrespectful but yeah. a job that, you know, is something that is, you know, a bit scary at that age. It's amazing and it's that really difficult time. We'll, yeah. we'll delve into that further, yeah. but it's a hard time and it's yeah. those, you know, realisations and, and those, those little things, like, for example, that letter... Yeah. It's the more intersected that, yeah. that makes a difference. It can change your entire life, you know what I mean? It can change every single thing that you kind of roll out from there on. You don't know where you could end up, you know? It could be good, bad, ugly, who knows? And would you say that, you know, that experience with your mechanic friend was sort of that light bulb moment? Yep. Was that the realisation? Was that the point yep. in time that you... Yep. It kind, of, it kind of gives you the light bulb moment to say that you have a choice and the choice is yours and what you put in from here is really going to determine your path possibly where mm. you're going it's not going to have a defined role exactly where you're going to end up mm. but you kind of have a bit of a road map where you're going to you know go or give yourself an opportunity to actually do something you know what I mean because a lot of people go down a lot of roads you know I mean I've seen mm. people that are a lot smarter than myself you know come to Macquarie Bank and everything and can't fit in you know mm. can't trade mm. Mm. can't do this can't do that so academically they might be the super smart people but mm. you still need to have a bit of street sense you know what I mean? You've yeah. got to have a bit of announce about it. You've got to be able to um, interact with people, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a kind of another lesson there that you find out later on in life. It's not just academics. Mm. And when you're interviewing for big jobs, they're going to look at your wham or whatever your uni yeah. mark is, but it all comes down to the person you are and how well yeah. that you're going to represent yeah. that company, yeah. right? And that's one of the big, the, one of the big problems we have at uh, work is actually when we interview traders, is there's always what we call an X factor. Yeah. You know I mean? yep. A lot of times when you go through and you do recruiting and everything and you look at a salesperson, mm. you can see someone like yourself is very good to talk to, you, yep. you're very good in communicating and everything mm. like that. Mm. You tick all the boxes to start off with. You know? yep. And yep. that's that's the majority of the boxes you want ticked for a salesperson. Mm. Whereas if a trader, we look for the X factor. So we can only get so much for information, yep. but then it comes down to kind of our gut feeling, what yep. we think if that person is hungry enough, mm. has come from a particular background or mm. really appreciates or values a dollar. Yep. You know what I mean? So we have other things that we have to bring into the equation, so to speak. And what do you think, just touching on, you know, what people are looking for in the workforce these days, obviously the marks and that that wow factor, that X factor. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the communication, the social skills, what do you think um, Trinity and other schools and and what do you think that organisations can do better to prepare their, Mm -hmm. you know, the people that they educate? That's a very very good question because we get to see a lot of people from, you know, private schools across the board and everything. Mm -hmm. I think one of the advantages I always found from Trinity was Mm -hmm. that, for me, Trinity was a melting pot. Because I think, I'm assuming it's the same these days, I don't know, but if you took the demographics of who comes to Trinity, you will Mm. get people from the north. You will get people from the west, you'll get people from the east, and you'll get people from the south. Mm. I was from the south, and I was Mm. fortunate enough I could meet people from the north Mm. and the northern beaches and everything. I met people from Ashfield, Stratfield, everything. Whereas, you know, my two kids go to basically Cranbrook and Scotts, and if you take the demographics of that, you could just about ring fence at two, three kilometres around there that would be 60, 70%, I'm guessing, Mm. you know what I mean? People that, you know, parents went there, they went there. It's very stereotyped, you know what I mean? So one of the great things about Trinity is actually the location where it is Mm. because you may or may not know it but you're actually getting influenced now by people around you from many Mm. different socio-economic areas you know what I mean and different ethnic backgrounds and everything which all goes into your makeup later on and how you come out as a person you know and I think it's something that it's not really talked about at Trinity but it's a very important thing that I found that's fascinating it's Mm. fascinating you say that because it's not something, like you said, that we give a lot of thought to or that's no. spoken about, yeah. but that's what prepares you best yeah. for the real world when yeah. you're exposed to all Because you're exposed to a lot more different things across the board. Absolutely fascinating. Mm. Words of wisdom um, from you to begin with. Mm. Just sort of going back to your story and those last few years of school, obviously your mentality changed and your outlook on education and, and you know, the way that you would attack school changed, but what do you think, um, from an academic side of things, improved the most or changed the most in those last two years to help you do so yeah, well? The, the, the main thing I had is that I, I also came from a family where my brother was um, five years older than me, mm. and my parents had, you know, come into basically growing up in a, you know, one-bedroom unit. I grew up with my parents in Padstow and that, so then when they came into some money, they actually enjoyed it. So they were, mm. you know, out and about and a bit. So I didn't have 
um, overbearing parents yep. or parents that really said you have to do this. And I joined Trinity in year eight, year nine. I didn't join in the mm. first cohort either. Yep. So in that respect, it actually, once I decided in year 10 where I wanted to go, and that was basically to get the best possible mark I could set myself up for, mm. it then came down to structure. Yep. And that is something that I actually was, you know, very disciplined with. You know what I mean? You know, for example, you know, I mean, I love playing rugby, so you'd have your rugby training. You know that you'd mm. only, you know, start your study maybe at 6.30 on a, a Tuesday night after training. Mm. You go through to 9.30. But on a weekend, I was very structured. Yeah. You know what I mean? I knew if I was playing at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that's perfectly fine. I knew that I could get up, I could start at a reasonable hour at 9, do, you know, no need to do exercise, study through to 1 o'clock, then make my way to the ground, yep. finish it. Often on a Saturday night, we would uh, go and catch up, let's say, for a... Uh, uh, juice or something yeah grape yeah. juice something like that um but then you know i mean on the sunday sunday was very structured you know mm. nine o'clock to twelve o'clock study you yeah. know twelve o'clock go get a pizza from panania pizza shop come back watch sports world to two o'clock then study to five have dinner then six o'clock to nine o'clock and that was it and it was just routine and that's one of the things i've actually found you know if you take that structure and routine into your life, you can take it to basically the majority of things you do. Mm. You know, you can take it into a family life. You can yeah. take it into looking after kids, and you take it to work. You know what I mean? You 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 wake up, and there's the kind of thing that we have at work is you know you wake up and you you kind of bring your best self to work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. And that's what you should do at school. You should bring your best self to school. Yeah. You should be also very appreciative that you know forty grand or whatever it costs to send you to school now mm. is not, you know, it's not chicken feed in this environment. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And you, you, it's it's worthy of you feeling as a good person at the end of year twelve that you've mm. actually hopefully given your parents something a bit back. Mm. You know what I mean? That you've yeah, been exactly. given an opportunity, which is yep. a very rare opportunity that a lot of people don't have that mm. availability of. You know. What I mean? And especially coming from those humble beginnings in Padstow, so, you know, yeah. I think that's something which I want to touch on a little bit more, mm. that you started there and your parents gave you an opportunity mm. and a start, but it's about taking that opportunity, 100%. right? And there are probably a lot of kids, you know, year 10, as I said, it is a tough crossroads, mm. and there are many kids out there that, you know, are in that position yep. like you were, you yep. know, really questioning what their future looked like, and especially sporting ones. Yep. What um, advice do you have to them? Um, in terms of their attitude and what do you think that uh, students like that should really do to change their mentality? To well, I think, I think we touched years. on the first bit, and the first bit for me is, you know, you shouldn't take it for granted. Mm. You know what I mean? You, sh you should actually sit down and just have a think about it and think how fortunate you are to be offered a place at a school such as Trinity, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. That, you know, there, there are literally thousands and thousands of people out there and parents that sit down at night time, I would assume, mm. who if they had the financial you know, stability and the actual excess funds or could take a loan out, would actually send their kids to Trinity. Mm. You know what I mean? So that's the kind mm. of number one. Mm. The next thing that I kind of got out of it, which I think was very important, is that I didn't want to end up getting to the end of year 12 mm. and to leave any marks on the table knowing yep. that I could have done better. Yeah. And that's and that kind of goes to where the structure comes from and folds into that. You know what mm. I mean? Because mm. if you have structure and you think you've got the best structure and the best setup that you have there, yeah. do you know what I mean? You're actually setting yourself up for success. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You're saying mm. I'm giving myself every available, every opportunity to actually get to the final end of the exam and actually say that, you know, I've done my best. Now, doing your best may be 80%. Yep. Doing your best for others may be 96.8%. And yep. for some other kids that might struggle, getting 65 compared to actually, you know, not getting anything and then at least still setting yourself up for, say, for example, to go to TAFE or to something else is mm. perfectly fine. Mm. But you just don't want to get to the end of it and say, you know what, I left 10% of, you know, hard mm. work on the table. Because it's disappointing in yourself, but it's also disappointing for others, I think. You know? And realistic goals is obviously something that 100%. you're, you know, yeah. you advocate for and... Mm. It's suited to the student, mm. whatever suits them mm. best and whatever, yeah. you know, they can achieve, mm. it's important. That's and that's realistic. what I'm saying, getting your, doing your best doesn't necessarily mean getting the highest mark, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. It's very important to make that, you know, to differentiate the difference there, mm. you know what I mean? Someone that gets 80 might in another environment get 65, yep. and that changes their whole life getting 80 as opposed to 65. Mm. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's how you want to view it. Another really important piece yeah. of advice and, yeah. and things that students need to hear because mm. it's not about getting that 99.95, no. it's about doing the best for you. Agreed. Yep. In terms of looking at, you know, who inspired you, who was most instrumental, um, you know, mentors, and they can be teachers, they can be mentors yeah. outside of school, but who do you feel that were the biggest mentors for you? Uh, towards well, can I list now? three? 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the first one I think that was very, very interesting to me was Ray Walker. Right. And so he was the, the PE teacher. Okay. Who wore the um, little white shorts with the white sing that you expect someone from World War Two, and he was a, I think he was a gunner on World War Two on one of the battleships. You know? Oh wow! And apparently his diary was um, very distressing in terms of what he saw and everything like that. But he was the kind of guy that came in, and I had him straight away for the 13 A's in rugby. Yep. And he was unrelenting. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, and he was the kind of person that I first got that kind of idea of that he would say, you know, you're going out, you're playing the 13 A's, I want you to give the best. Yep. I want you to try to get to that point. I want you to try to win all the time. You know what I mean? Not giving up other principles, of course, but he was the first one that kind of gets a bit of fire in you. You mm. know what I mean? So yeah. he was a very interesting man, I think, especially for what he went through. Mm. Then, of course, there was um, Ian Moore. Yep. who we all know, who basically yep. intercepting the letter in year 10, you know, mm. changed my life. And changed my life too in the way of thinking about structure and that. You know, yep. he was the first person of any teachers that I ever knew that would actually say, okay, the way to get more marks in multiple choice is that you're going to do 20 multiple choice in economics, for example, yep. and we know that there's a possibility that 11 out of the 20 are going to come up again. But if you have the memory retention to actually identify it straight away and know the answer mm. before, mm. you know what I mean, you look at the question, Bang, you go through, you save the time, and you sit there at lunch on a, a Wednesday, Thursday, and a Friday for an hour eating your lunch, going through multiple choice. You think it's irrelevant at the time, mm. but then when you get to your exam, the light bulb moment happens and things are easier, you have more time to do essays. You know what I mean? So that's yeah. a very important person, you know what I mean? Mm. In terms of showing you that structure and doing extra work yep. can lead to extra benefits. Mm. You know what I mean? mm. And then the last person I hate to say it was um, the headmaster. Mr. West, you know yep. what I mean? He always had a bee in his bonnet about me for some reason and suspended me for longer time than necessary for indiscriminate rucking and things like that. But I think he was an amazing man. You know yeah. I mean, I think, and I think his life too is very important in terms of the way I think he ran the school because, you know, he ran it, I think, very structured as well. You know what I mean? Yep. He looked after every teacher and he prided himself on knowing the name of every student in the school, mm. which is a pretty amazing feat. You know, you know what I mean? And I think he was the, he kind of changed the way that a, a principal was viewed at, mm. that you could actually just bump into the principal and have a chat to him. You know what I mean? Yeah. He would comment about your football or something like that, you know what I mean? As mm. opposed to mm. having a, a figure up there that is, you know, a holy figure above mm. and beyond anything. He was very approachable. Yeah. So I think he kind of changed a lot of the school's kind of mm. um, education and processes and that. So I think looking back in retrospect a lot more, I think he was a massive influence, but not at the time. Yeah, right. So it's stepping back and then yeah. realising that. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, touching on Mr Moore. Um, yes. And I've got him as a teacher this year. Okay. So when you say, you know, Maltese, I get the shakes you, you a little bit, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did the trials last week and I need to do a bit of work on those Maltese. But yep. it's about that structure, that repetition. Yep. And you get that at a private school like Trinity. Yep. You know, you get teachers that love what they do yep. so much that they'll do anything to help you. 100%. And it, it's unique. So... Mm. The names you mentioned, especially Mr. West as well. Yeah. Yeah. Influential uh, members of the school yep. over time. Now, looking at time management and balance, and you, I love how you um, spoke about, you know, the Panania Pizza Shop and they're yep. watching the sports world and doing the rugby and all this sort of stuff. But how do you feel that Trinity prepared you well for, um, for the life after school and in the workforce, looking at time management yeah. and balancing things? I think it's just, I think it's more the small things you pick up along the way, you know mm. what I mean? There's mm. no like, edu there's no formal educational process that, you know, sets you up for it. Mm. But I think behind the scenes, you're kind of getting these, um, you know, like subliminal kind of messages and everything that unbeknownst to yourself, you're actually setting yourself up with structure, you know what I mean? Yeah. To have someone, you know, like Ian say that, you know, this weekend you're going to give me two essays on Monday. Mm. And you say, but it's a Friday, I want to do something. He says, no, you'll give me two essays. One will be on monetary policy and one will be on globalisation. You say, I don't have time. You'll work out time. Yep. You'll make time. So mm. you kind of find out with a lot of the things, you know what I mean, especially when you do sport. You know, Sunday sometimes you have to go to chapel, for example. Yep. You, you know what I mean? There's all these other things you do. You mm. may think they become a bit tedious and boring, but they are setting you up. In exactly. a, they're giving you a template, so to speak, mm. about what's ahead for you and how you want to fit into that. Now, if I wanted to play less sport and drop out of sport, perfectly fine. Do you mm. know what I mean? If I mm. want to do more study, I could have done more study. Mm. But I had to find out what was best for me. And that was yeah. the kind of structure that, you know, I think all kids have to work out. Some kids are not very good, you know what I mean, at sitting down for a two-hour gap. Mm. You know, it might yeah. be that you suit an hour and a half and having an hour off, whatever. Mm. You know what I mean? You have to work out what is best for you and, you know, kind of customise it, I would say. Mm. 
and balancing with sport especially we've got a lot yeah. of fine athletes out there but it's an important part of the education 100%. program isn't yeah. it yeah and i think i think without sport you become you become too polar you know what i mean mm. like it's you know and there are some other schools out there we might as well mention the name grammar or something like that yeah they're not yeah. very good at sport you know what I mean? Their, yep. their first 15, they don't have one, might actually play the thirds or the fourths. And I don't think that's an encouraging thing from a team sport of view or thinking that, you know what I mean, you really should be encouraging people to do sport across the board. Mm. Because I really do think that team sports especially play a very important role of, you know, you are relying upon other people and other people are relying upon you. So it's kind of builds on these little building blocks that you get throughout life that, mm. you know, depending how you want to live your life, if you want to lead a, you know, a, a reasonably, you know, upstanding member of society, so to speak, you know what I mean? Other people yeah. do rely upon you and you do rely upon them. So it's all those little things that add up. Those principles. Um, in terms of people and connections you made and friends you made yeah. whilst at Trinity back um, in that ninth yeah. class of 1984, uh, what have you maintained post-school, friendship-wise? Believe it or not, I have not maintained a great deal yeah. of relationships from Trinity in terms of, like, a, a social aspect, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I still keep in contact with about half a dozen people from Year 12, mm. but they're not who I would consider someone that I ring up and go out with all the time, except yeah. one person right. who is still one of my closest friends from um, when I first met him, which is um, Scott Lovett, who lived in the area. Yep. So I keep in contact with him. I literally, we talk two, three times a week and chat. So there is one of my best friends is from school. Yep. I made um, closer friends, believe it or not, through university. Mm. Now, I, you go to somewhere like Joey's, Joey's is all school. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yep. we're, we've got Joey's people that, you know, at Macquarie Bank, and it's basically, you know, my 10 best mates are Joey's, you know. So we're, we're catching up for a Joey's reunion. I went out with my mate from Joey's, you know what I mean? So yep. it's a different kind of... Now, whether or not that's part of Trinity being broken up as well, maybe, we've as we spoke before with where people are sourced from and everything, mm. I don't know. Mm. Um, mm. And some other people are different, you know, so it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's what your year's like, really. Would you have ever thought, Lex, back in 1982, that, you know, looking back all these years, that you would be where you are today in the role you were, no. in, in the role you are and, and what you're doing, what you're doing? In year 10, no. Yep. I would have never had that thought, you know what wow. I mean? You know, mm. In year 10, I most really would have celebrated getting to my age at the moment, you know what I mean? Because I've got a few friends from, you know, Padstow that are now deceased, you know what I mean, through, you know, one through drug addiction and, you know, mm. other bits and bobs and car mm. crashes and mm. stuff mm. like that. Mm. So you do lose people along the journey. Yep. Um, and sometimes you, you lose more and, you know, it's the, the kind of way of it. But I would never have contemplated year 10 being here yep. because the funny thing is I would have never have thought of this spot. Yeah. In year 10, I was a lot more limited mm. in what I thought was out there in the real world. You know, mm. I had never really been exposed to, mm. you know, financial markets, for example. Yeah. Totally foreign to me. You know, you yeah. grew up in Padstow, yeah. everyone's got a working trade, you know, your parents are in the crane game, everything like that. You don't yeah. talk to anyone that's working in a stock market. You don't mm. talk to anyone in a uh, financial role or management role or anything. Yeah. And you don't really go to town bar to partake in the occasional drink, as we mentioned before. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's not something that you're aware until you kind of get to uni and then mm. you kind of do the commerce subjects mm. and then you actually see what's behind it, what's making these decisions and what you're actually studying and you're starting to learn about. So for me, that was a big change. And, you know, you remember, we didn't have the internet, you know what I yeah. mean? You don't have 150 channels on the TV. You weren't really aware of the stock markets or anything because yeah. they weren't relevant. Yeah. You know, now yeah. I think, you know, people of um, your age are a lot more aware of stock markets. You know, you know what's happening with Tesla being a crazy share, Facebook, all this kind yeah. of stuff. So yeah. I think just media alone and social media and everything is actually brought to the fore, mm. you know I mean, the information gathering process to learn about so many more things. You know, you can get on the internet and just type in, as we know, you know, what stocks to buy, bang, it's listed. Where yeah. Back then it's a book, you know I mean, there's no internet, there's nothing like that. So mm. it's, a, it's a different world. And that leads on perfectly um, to my next yeah. question, more focus around that, the COVID-19 pandemic yeah. and the impact on Australia's economy. And especially for young Australians, yeah. things are going to be tough in the future. Uh, the future at the moment looks a little bit grim and I'm keen to hear some advice from you and some practical advice mm. that we can all take on board. But how do you see our post-COVID Australia and our post-COVID world being different uh, mm. to what we had before? 
Uh, well, I think the, the most obvious thing now that's come out of, you know, COVID, ignoring we can talk about the fiscal kind of side of it, mm. is the work from home aspect, mm. which is, it's incredible, you know what I mean? Like in, you know, January, February, we would never think that, you know, for example, now at Macquarie Bank, we have uh, 20% of the people back in the office. Yep. It's still 80% out, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. Um, I think people's mindset has changed also. I think people are now thinking that, I think it's a reverse kind of psychology that people are thinking. People are now thinking, well, I'm working from home for six months, so I'll work out how, how much I want to go back to work as yep. opposed to the other way around saying, you have a job, you're employed, once the COVID's over, you will be at work and then we'll see if it goes the other way. So mm. I think there's going to be a lot of structural change that will yep. happen. Yep. You know I mean? yep. um, it'll be interesting with you know commercial real estate, what's being built now, um, mm. leasing restaurants. You know what I mean. Whether or not you know, once upon a time, you know, you'd buy a property within, you know, one kilometre of a railway station had a twenty percent premium at Petersham, for example. Mm. Now that's most probably gone down. Maybe yeah. two kilometres out, that price has now gone up. So there's going to be a lot of reweighting, mm. and there are going to be very large macro things that are going to happen as well. You know right. I mean? And I think they're going to be macro and they'll be yep. very structural. Like yeah. Things will change forever. And, you know, as we mentioned before in our pre-talk, you know I mean? You're actually living through history now. Mm. This, this is a major event. Mm. You know I mean, this is something that we don't even know in six months' time if the contagion gets up to 50 or 100 million people. You know what I mean? We're exactly. currently at 850 unfortunate deaths, 850,000. We don't know. This might tinker on for 5, 10 years and get to 10 mm. million deaths. We mm. don't know. Mm. Mm. You know what I mm. mean? We don't know about the vaccine. We don't know if the vaccine's worse than the actual disease. You know what I mean? It's, there's, there's a lot of things there. And yeah. government-wise, it's, it's pretty terrifying. Mm. You know, we've gone from a situation of February thinking of having a, you know, a budget that's square to spending $185 billion. And unfortunately, exactly. you will most probably pay for that a lot more than Ian and I have, but I'll end up paying for it more. Everyone's going to pay for it more. So mm. Mm. it works out, you know, superannuation, everything. So it's it's a monumental change. Massive, yeah. massive part of history. Across the board. Yeah. And some great insight and some great wisdom there once yeah. again from you. Um, in wrapping up, I'm going to bring some stats in into yep. it here at the end. I'm um, looking at market cap. I'm going to talk a little bit technical. Um, Macquarie's market cap is 46.6 billion. Not too far behind ANZ's yep. 51 and uh, NAB Bank's uh, 58. Do you ever think we will see a day where there will be such thing as the big five banks rather than the big four? Uh, the way we kind of um, look, it's interesting, but I, I still think at the end of the day, the reason Macquarie has been so successful is that it's more of a niche bank. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. It, um, it reacts very quickly to changes. Mm. If you look back in the history of Macquarie Bank, you'll see there's been some very, very large changes in the silos and the mm. way it's reported. Whereas the big four banks are very traditional banks. Yep. You know what I mean? They stick yep. to their bread and butter, which is deposits and you know lending out home loans, and they have other bits and pieces to it. So, look, I don't think it will be referred to as the big five. Yep. You know what I mean? I, mm. I think Macquarie will always be rather a very individual bank and morphing itself from one opportunity to another and, you know, taking off old stuff and adding on new. Mm. But I think the big four banks are slower at doing that. They're more traditional, shall we say. And I think what I got out of that little beginning part and that first mm. question we asked, there's a lot to, a lot more to Macquarie um, than meets the eye. Yes. It's not right. just a bank. It's no. more than just a bank and it yeah. does a lot more. Yeah. And, and in a way, you can sort of uh, argue that it is more important than the big four because mm. it helps the big four and it does so much more. Mm. So, so fascinating to gain a bit of insight into that yeah. as well as an economist. Well, Lex, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. As I said, first uh, post-COVID interview, and it's yeah. an absolute honour to have heard your story. You're uh, a very, very kind man and compassionate guy for coming in. I, I know that you organised your night guys to come on and all these different bits and pieces to get here. So we really do appreciate you finding the time in uh, such a tough t circumstance. And your story is truly inspirational. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's something that I'm sure a lot of year 10 mm. and 11s will get, start, mm. get a lot out of. But uh, for me, looking back on my time at Trinity and reflecting on what you've said there, there are a lot of you know really interesting mm. comments and, and uh, bits and pieces which current and future students will make the most of. So thanks for your time. All the very best and... We can't shake, can we? Can we can't. We're going to do an elbow, I think. So let's hope that uh, things Pleasure. aren't too bad economically in the future, but... Who knows? We'll find out. We're a part of history, like exactly you said. Exactly right. Thanks, Lex. Thank you. Thank you for the invite.